Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I uh, just want to make a few uh, brief uh, announcements. Uh, this coming Sunday morning we will be having in-person service. That will be at 11 a.m. We hope you can come and join us. We will practice uh, social distancing. We do have our pews roped off. And let me say the last statistic that I uh, looked at, there are 162 active cases now in Carter County. So due to that, uh, we will be having service on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And then on Wednesday night, we'll be live streaming here from the sanctuary. And we hope you'll join us for that. And what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to keep our eyes on and monitor this uh, coronavirus. And all this is subject to change. I just want you to know that. And your safety is, is our top uh, priority. I'm hoping real soon we'll be able to get back and have all of our regular services. I want to thank everyone for your patience. And if you want to send the Lord's tithes, if you can't be here on Sunday morning, that is Milligan Free Will Baptist Church, uh, Post Office Box 113, Milligan College, Tennessee, and 37682. So I hope, I hope you got that down. And at this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask His blessing over our study tonight in Hebrews chapter 13. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for this day. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. More than anything, Lord, we thank you for redeeming us from our sins through the shedding of your precious holy blood on Calvary's cross. And we know, Lord, by your stripes we are healed. Tonight, God, we just ask that your healing will will uh, travel to these places, Lord, to these individuals that are sick, that you'd lay your healing hand upon them. Touch Brother Lawrence, Lord, and Sister Mary, Brother Ken, and Sister Mary Ann. And, Lord, we ask that you'd touch Brother Benjamin Tallman, Lord, that they'll be able to get rid of this fluid that's on his lungs. And, Lord, we just claim total healing for Benji. We love you. We praise you. Now, God, we ask that you will anoint our lips of clay with the Holy Spirit. As we look into your word tonight, Lord, help us rightly divide it. May, it. may it be a blessing and encouragement to your people. And if there's anyone that's lost that's watching this, Lord, I ask that the sweet Holy Ghost will convict them of their sins and draw them to Jesus. Lord, just get glory out of our lives and we'll praise you. Help me remember what I've studied. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Originally it was my goal uh, tonight to start with verse 5 and to go all the way down to verse number 25. But the more I studied, the more the Holy Spirit impressed on my heart and mind for us to deal with just the next two verses. And that's verse 5 and 6. And by the help of the Lord, I, our lesson is going to focus I may only get to one of these points tonight, but our lesson is going to focus, and I'm going to entitle it this, The Two Big C's. The Two Big C's. You say, what are these C's? Well, one is covetousness. And this is a very serious sin. The Bible has a lot to say about covetousness. We could call this first C a bad C. Something that should not be a part of our lives as Christians. And then the second big C, and this is a, a good big C, and that is contentment. I don't know of any other nation that is blessed to the extent that we are in these United States of America. You know, we like to classify sins and we, uh, we say some sins are worse than others. 
But when it comes to the sin of covetousness, this is the mother of all sins. We, we can see a, a number of things involved in this first big C. So I'm going to read verses 5 and 6, and then we're going to go forward with our study. The Word of the Lord. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content, get this, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, this should be enough for us, beloved, God speaking here, For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We know in this chapter... The author makes a practical application of the theme of the epistle. Having set before us at length the amazing grace of God toward his believing people by the provision that he's made for us in our Lord Jesus Christ, which is our mediator and the surety of the covenant, having shown that they now have in Christ the substance of all that was shouted forth in the ceremonial law the tabernacle, and also the priesthood of Israel. We now have pressed upon us the responsibilities and the obligations which devolve upon those who are the favored recipients of those spiritual blessings. We know in the first four verses we're uh, encouraged to let brotherly love continue. We're also taught to be hospitable. And to take care of those that need help. Jesus, remember, said, And as much as you've done it unto the least of these, your brethren, you've also done it unto me. And remember, they said, Well, Lord, when saw we you naked and you needed clothing? When saw we you were sick and you needed help? Or you were in prison and we visited you? And that's when Jesus said, For as much as you've done it unto the least of these, your brethren, you've also done it unto me. Because we have the love of God in our hearts, we ought to love one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has loved us and has forgiven us. Every opportunity that the Lord gives us, we should take advantage of that. And we should not forget to help those that are in bonds or those that are incarcerated, those that are in prison, as bound with them. We read in verse 3, And them which suffer adversity, those that's being persecuted because of their faith. Let's not forget them. And then in verse 4, and this is what we dealt with uh, last Wednesday night, we looked at the sanctity of marriage, that the bed is undefiled, and God has ordained that one man be united to one woman in holy matrimony. God was the one that instituted marriage. Therefore, anything outside of marriage between one man and one woman is forbidden in the Bible. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And the two or the twain shall be one flesh. So we see we should take this thing seriously. Husbands, that we love our wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Wives, that you submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. It is my firm conviction that we're struggling greatly in America because we have the family out of order. We need to follow the counsels of God when it comes to the family. The man, that Christian man, is to be the spiritual head or leader of his family. And the wife is to be the, her, her husband's helper. I know my life without Sister Kathy is incomplete. But having Sister Kathy as my wife, she completes me. And I by no means claim to be perfect. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But husbands, God gave you your wife. She's your responsibility. 
And you're to love her. You're to cherish her. And as Brother Peter said, you're to dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Oh, God, give us more knowledge. God, give us more wisdom that we might be the Christians in the home that you would have us to be. Listen, if we don't get it right in the homes, we won't get it right in the church. And if we don't get it right in the church, we won't get it right in our community and our society. So we know that God wants to bless His people. And God will take care of fornicators and adulterers. God will judge them. Now we come to verses 5 and 6. Well, what is covetousness? The best definition I got for covetousness is this. It's the opposite of contentment. It's, it's being dissatisfied with how your life is going or even with, with what God has blessed you with. And the Bible tells us, you know, God, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul said, but my God shall supply for all your need according to his riches in glory. So my friends, we need to be careful that we don't allow this sin of covetousness to control us and to manipulate us and to get us away from doing what God would have us to do. Now notice the word conversation in verse number 5. Back when the King James Version was translated, it had a more comprehensive meaning than what we have today. When we say conversation, we uh, mostly are referring to one person speaking to another. But it was, it was a broader thing here with those when they translated the King James Version. What is the conversation? Well, it refers to our conduct or our behavior. Yes, my friends, if our, if our conduct does not match up with our confession of faith in the Lord Jesus, then we have believed in vain. I know the Bible says we're not saved by works, but by grace are you saved uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. But it also says, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So if we have been saved by grace, washed in the precious blood of the Lamb of God, regenerated by the Spirit of God, you and I, our life, or the way we conduct ourselves should reflect the faith that we exercise in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to be able to win the world to Christ until we have convinced to them by our life, by how we live, they've got to see a change that takes place within the heart. God help us this evening for our behavior and our conduct to match up with that that is becoming a Christian. I'm reminded of what Brother John said in his little epistle. And he said, if we abide in Christ, we also ought to walk even as he walked. You say, well, preacher, how can I walk like Jesus walked? How can I live like Jesus lived? My friend, we can only walk like Jesus walked and live like Jesus lived if He is living in our hearts through the person of the Holy Spirit. And through the Spirit of God, we can bring this sin of covetousness under control. So we have here an, we have an evil, that's covetousness. And we also have its remedy, and that is contentment that's set before us side by side. And so... What we need to do is we need to make sure that our conduct is not with covetousness. Now this word covetousness, you might want to write this down. It literally has the meaning of lover of silver. And the Bible has told us for the love of money is the root of all evil. God wants us to be free of this sin of covetousness. We know that having riches doesn't send your soul to hell. 
But my friend, if we trust in riches rather than trusting in the living God, those riches become our God. And they replace the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is definitely not a good thing. We know when Paul talks to Timothy about the qualifications of a bishop, he says these words, not given uh, to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler. And then he adds these words, not covetous. Yes, the Bible is very clear when it comes to the sin of covetousness. I want you to open up your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And I want to read, I want to read verse 17. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Well, what's the Lord saying here? What belongs to you, you need to take care of it. You should not desire to have what your neighbor has in a way that you begin to resent what he has and even become envious as to what your neighbor has. I've heard countless story after story where neighbors have got in a feud over a few inches of dirt. How silly. How foolish. My friend, the material things of this world are going to pass away. The Bible tells us the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 2 we read these words. While they behold your chaste conversation. Note the word behold. It was not the word here but behold. The term then has ref reference to behavior or deportment. Let me just stop here and say as Christians we should want to turn people on to Jesus not away from Jesus. My friends this this is something very serious. We're called unto holiness. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 but as he which hath called you is holy God's holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, we're not only talking about our external life or our conduct. This also includes both character and conduct. Yes, my friends, the opposite of covetousness is contentment. God takes care of His people. Our affections, our thoughts should not be on just attaining more wealth. Our attention and our thoughts should be upon becoming more like Jesus and leading more people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, Covetousness is the opposite of contentment. It's a being dissatisfied with our present lot and portion. It's an over-eager desire for the things of this world. It's a lusting after what God has forbidden or withheld from us. My friends, we just need to be content with such things as we have. Jesus said a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And there he has told us not to be covetous. We, our desire should be to please God. You say, preacher, I, is there anything wrong with me wanting to do better in life? No. 
Is there anything wrong with me for providing for my family and, and want my family to have it better than I did? No. But friend, when we take it to its extreme and we put it in front of the Lord, that's when it becomes an idol. That's when it has the potential or the influence to pull us away from God. The Bible is full of examples of people who coveted things or desired things that they were not supposed to have. I think of Elisha's servant, Gehazi. You remember Naaman had been told by a little maiden that there, there was a prophet of God in Israel. That if he would go there, uh, Naaman was uh, a leper. He said, if, if you can get to Israel and get to the man of God, Elisha, I know he'll heal you. But we know that story. How the, Elisha had told him to go dip, uh, I believe it was five times or seven times. I believe it's seven times. Dip seven times in the river Jordan. And old Naaman got upset about it. He said, there are better, cleaner rivers over where I'm from. But the, I, thought, I thought the man of God would come and strike me or something or speak a word over me. See, that's our problem many times. We have it built into our minds and our thoughts how God's got to work and how God's got to move. Listen, friend, God is sovereign. God is a ruler over the universe. I'm glad he's my father. But listen, there are matters you and I have no control over. But God can move in an instance. Better be careful what you ask God for. He might just give it to you and you might later regret that. What are you saying, preacher? Well, we know when the children of Israel lusted in the wilderness. The Bible said the Lord gave unto them what they wanted, but He sent uh, leanness into their souls. They, they got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. We can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The fall of Adam and Eve. They lusted after or they coveted after that which God had forbidden. And we know that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you'll recall how the devil uh, tried to convince through the serpent Eve that God was uh, withholding something that was good from her. What did the enemy do? The enemy tried to cast a doubt in Eve's mind. Well, maybe this isn't such a bad thing. No, my friend, we need to look at sin the same way God looks at sin. Sin has, has split many of a home. It's wrecked many of a marriage that's ended in divorce. It's left boys and girls starving to death for food and love from a drunkard father. Or a drunkard mother. God help us tonight. To realize that there are a lot of things in this old world. We think we have to have. We don't really have to have. But I love what uh, in Lamentations brother Jeremiah said. He said the Lord is my portion. Therefore will I hope in him. My friend where's your hope at? Who's your hope in? Who is your faith resting in? I hope it's resting in Jesus Christ. What are you living for? To make more money? Or are you living for the glory of God? And if God blesses you and prospers you, you're not just to use that on yourself and, and yes, provide for your family, but we're to pay the Lord's tithes and we're to give an offering on top of that and we're to help as many people as we can possibly with the blessings that God sends our way. Remember Balaam in the Bible. The Bible tells us his downfall was that he loved the wages of unrighteousness. It attracted him. It allured him. Remember Achan. He saw the Babylonian garment. He saw the gold. And we know that he coveted after it or he desired it. And thus he took it to himself. He dug a hole in his tent and hid what he had stolen, what God had forbidden him. Well, what happened, to, what happened to Achan? They found his sin, found him out. But not only was Achan affected, the Bible tells us that not only was he stoned to death, but all of his family. 
I cannot emphasize this enough tonight. If you're not living in the will of God, brother, you need to repent. You need to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And you need to be the godly, holy man in your home that your wife needs to look up to, that your children need to look up to. And I say, God, help us. I'm afraid there are many in this country. And I'm just not talking about the wealthy people. It affects those in poverty too. And there is this dangerous movement going on right now. And the underlying teachings of it is this. What you have, you don't need to have it because you didn't get it rightly. And therefore what you have, I have a right or I have access to that. And it doesn't matter what you say or what you do. My friend, that is communism. That is socialism. We don't need more government on us. We need more of Jesus on us. We need to make up our mind like Elijah. When we know the prophets of Baal and the prophets of, of the grove, there was a challenge between them. And he said, let the God be the God of Israel who answereth by fire. But I'm particularly thinking about the statement that he said. Have to make your choice. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then serve Him, follow Him. If Baal, serve Him and follow Him. But we know who won the contest. The prophets of Baal and of the groves, they cut themselves, they even began bleeding. And they called upon Baal uh, to somehow light a fire uh, to the sacrifice. But Baal didn't hear because Baal didn't exist. But thank God, the man of God, Elijah, repaired the altar, thank God. And we know he called upon the living God of heaven. And the Lord sat down fire from heaven. And it consumed the sacrifice and, and it even licked up the water that he had poured around the trenches. My friend, our God is real. Our God deserves our all. He deserves our best, not our leftovers. I'm afraid too many are serving God at their own convenience. My friend, it will cost you convenience to serve God. But when you come to the end of your life, you will not regret anything you've done for the cause of Christ. And the church. Preacher, I thought, I thought we were going to have a Bible study tonight. Seems to me like you're preaching. That's all right. We need it. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. We need to get back to the truth of God's Word. I'm thinking of evil Ahab. Which coveted after Naboth's vineyard. The vineyard belongs to Naboth. It was his inheritance. But Ahab wanted it. He even offered Naboth money for it. And Naboth said, hey, this is my inheritance. It's not for sale. And he went like a crybaby to wicked Jezebel to the palace. And you know what that evil, wicked woman did? His wife, she convinced him. She said, well, you're the king. And she developed a plan and a scheme ultimately for Ahab to get what didn't rightfully belong to him. He ended up having Naboth killed, falsely accused, and he went to possess the land. But not too long after that, the man of God came and confronted him and told him, listen, this does not belong to you. And the same dogs that licked up the blood of Naboth, they're going to lick up your blood too. My friend, sin carries a heavy price tag with it. It's not worth it. But I want you to know tonight, living for Jesus is worth it. Praising God is worth it. Winning lost souls to Jesus Christ for salvation is worth it. Remember Ananias and Sapphira in the Bible. You know, it was within their power. Uh, there was nothing wrong if they would have been honest with what they had. They sold the land. But they were pretending that they were giving it all to the work of the Lord. And if they had come before the man of God and said, we've decided and we've prayed and God wants us to give this portion, that would have been all right. 
And of course the man of God, Peter, faced them. He said, why have Satan filled your heart? Why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? And we know what happened. Ananias and Sapphira both fell over dead. My friend, this thing's much more serious than people give it credit. The Lord wants our lives to reflect His glory. So we're told we're not to desire or long for things that belong to others. All right. So he said, let your conversation, your behavior, your deportment. And let me just say this. I always got a little nervous when we got our report cards. <laughs> and that one, that one that I really, really, really took a... I wanted to make all A's, don't we all? But there's that deportment grade. <laughs> and I have to be honest with you. I didn't always get an A or an A+. Plus. I didn't always do what was right in school. I knew that my daddy and mama, they had to sign off on the grade card. And boy, if, if my deportment wasn't what it ought to be, <laughs> my daddy and mama corrected me. They didn't depend upon the school or the church to correct me. They correct me themselves. And dad and mama, if you're watching this, I want to thank you for raising us boys in a Christian home. And teaching us to respect our elders. To respect what belongs to others. My, my. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Mm. And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Beloved. Let's focus our lives on bringing others to Christ. On helping other Christians. Encouraging them. On living such a life that it will inspire others. That it will help them. Not to just live to become wealthy. But that we live to bring glory and honor to Jesus. You say, preacher, is it a sin to be wealthy? No, absolutely not. But it is a sin to trust. The Bible says... Trust not in uncertain riches. Where much is given, much is required. Where little is given, little is required. It sh we should be content. We should be satisfied with such things as you have or you have. I love what David said. He said, I have been young, now am I old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor is seed bagging bread. But my God shall supply for all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Yes, my friends, godliness with contentment is great gain. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Let's see what our Lord has to say. Matthew chapter 6. Here's what Jesus says. Let's go on down to about verse. Okay, let's go to verse 19. He says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is. Where's your treasure tonight? For where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. Then we go on down to verse 24. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye or you cannot serve God and mammon. God and mammon. What is that word for mammon? 
It's riches. Then Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat or food, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet, hallelujah, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed <laughs> like one of them. Wherefore if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now get this. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Amen? I love this. But seek ye first what? The kingdom of God. Where there's the kingdom of God, that means there's a king. And we should seek to please the king and to do what's right and what's honorable and what's beneficial and holy. This is a promise. But seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and what? His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Yes, we need contentment. But we need to guard against the sin of covetousness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word hath I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Lord, help us to be content with such things as we have. Lord, I know all that I have. You gave it to me. You've blessed me, O oh God. Help us always to recognize you, Lord, for your bountiful blessings that you bestow upon us. For Lord, we all were paupers spiritually. We were on our way to devil's hell. And you loved us. You cared for us so much. That you went to the old rugged cross. And laid down your life for us. And your word tells us you had not where to lay your head. We know, Lord, that you became poor for us. That through your poverty... We might be made rich. Oh God. Help us to please you. Help us oh Lord to be satisfied. With what you give us. Lord you give us far above and beyond what we deserve. Help us Lord to so honor you. Not just with our voice and our lips of praise. But Lord with our life that we live. We love you. We praise you. Now, Lord, dismiss us in your loving care. We give you the glory. We give you the praise for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You have a good evening in Christ. And hopefully we will see you Sunday at 11 a.m. here in the church. God bless you.